This episode is brought to you by Hills Pet Nutrition. Every shelter pet deserves a second chance, and you're making it possible for thousands of them every day. Because when you feed your pet Hills, you help feed a shelter pet, which helps make them healthy, happy, and more adoptable, changing their life forever. So they can change yours. Over 14 million shelter pets fed and adopted. Science did that. Visit hillspet.com slash podcast to learn more. When a man is reported dead in the Mungyang Mountains, the police are not sure what to expect. The most likely case is that this is a lost hiker that died in the woods, but the police could have never guessed what they would see as their cars drove up that unpaved single-lane cliffside road. The man who reported the body explained that as he hiked up the mountain, he noticed a doll or a statue up ahead. In the police world, it's almost never a doll, mannequin, or statue. As the man got closer to get a better look, that's when he saw something he would never forget. It shook him to the core and made him say a prayer. A large wooden cross was erected up on a flattened quarry, and on it hung a man, head bowed and knees bent. Dried blood pooled from his hands and feet. A man had been crucified. Welcome to Korean True Crime with me, your host, Mimi Mizuko. Thank you to Vix Mack, Lala, William White, G1 Edwards, Nico, Elijah Hancock, Anominum, Dr. Bob, My96, Lumos, Emma Brown, David Tafoya, Adriana, Dade512, Lisa, and Shebeka for your support on Patreon. Thank you for voting on today's episode topic. Patrons vote on future episode topics and hear the episodes first with ad-free early access. We now have a sticker bonus tier and a hoodie bonus tier. Become a patron for three months and earn a reward. Thank you to my amazing patrons for making this show possible. I will be discussing Christian beliefs and stories in this episode. However, as someone that's not a part of this religion, I will do my best to accurately represent these stories and beliefs respectfully. Feel free to email me at koreantruecrime at gmail.com for any corrections that affect the episode. Warning, today's episode contains descriptions of bodily mutilation. Listener discretion is advised. Chu hyun woke to the settling rain from the previous day's monsoon. A thick layer of pollen and pollution made the morning mist yellow. That early Sunday morning, hyun had nothing to do. He was long since retired and lived with his protective Alaskan Malamutes. Having retired from a life working in the Christian church, hyun now said he was merely an old beekeeper living with his dogs. His Sienna farmhouse was built far away from society, between two large mountains, past less than a dozen small farms huddled together on the unpaved dirt road. To reach Hyunsu's home, you must leave the main road to cross a small river, whose water flows over the only road, barely large enough for a compact car to drive over. The mountains in spring are covered in wildflowers and lush green trees, Hyunsu lived in his own Eden, far away from the troubles of the world. That morning, Sunday, May 1st, 2011, he got up to check on his bees. His dogs had been barking all morning and he needed to get out of the house. He didn't keep his bees near his home, but instead in various places deep in the woods and on the mountain. He began his trek to the closest of his bees, which were about a kilometer up the mountain behind his home. This mountain was rocky and had it one time been used as a quarry for mining, before it was abandoned. One of these mine entrances was the perfect spot for Hyunsu's bees to be safe from the elements, but also attract wild bees to make a new home. In his time living in the wilderness, he seldom saw anyone visit the area. He knew his neighbors well and their habits, but as he got to the top of a hill, he saw a white Sangyong Kurando, a compact crossover SUV car, 
parked in a flat area off of the old dirt road used by the mining company. This small mountain wasn't the typical hiking spot and didn't have any hiking paths to make it accessible or safe. As he continued up the rocky cliffs, he saw a statue had been placed on a flat part of the quarry. It looked like the typical wooden cross with the Christian deity's son Jesus hanging from it to represent his death. Churches often do things together in nature like hikes, so perhaps this was a morning prayer retreat for the church's followers. Hyunsu was not a stranger to being a devout follower of Christianity, as he had served as a pastor for a now disgraced church. Hyunsu approached the statue, intrigued by its design. With the car being parked lower on the mountain, it seemed like the owner was probably still here, but nowhere to be seen. Unable to see very far, he was now less than five meters away from the statue, in disbelief at the horror before him. He saw that it wasn't a statue, but a man hanging on a wooden cross, adorned with a crown of thorns, arms outstretched and nailed to the cross. He had only questions. Why? Did this man want to bear the sins of the corrupt? Did he want to experience the pain of Jesus' death? Or did someone do this to him? I raise even more questions. Was this a murder, a suicide, or an assisted suicide? The bizarre death raised too many questions that only the deceased could answer. Can a person really endure the pain of doing this to themselves? Can someone drive nails through their own hands? Did someone assist him? Was he alive when the process began? Or was this a murder with a very odd staging? In a situation like this, there are numerous factors to consider. The police needed to be sensitive about this because the death might hold great significance for the Christian community, and it can also be deeply offensive. Chu Hyunsu decided not to run, but instead took photos on his phone, wondering that if when he went back to his home at the bottom of the mountain, if the entire scene would just disappear. After taking photos, he descended back to his home to get service and call the police. He saw as dozens of cop cars arrived to hike up the mountain to find the traumatic site. He wondered if it was possible for this man to have done this to himself. Hyunsu collected his thoughts in a Neighbor Cafe blog, a website where you can create a private and public blog with group forums. Hyunsu's blog, Giru Chanin Saramdru, or People Looking for a Way, was a member-only community which I was able to join and gain access to from 2011. Zhu Hyunsu stumbled upon the crucified man by chance visiting his beehives that he'd put higher up on the mountain. If he hadn't have gone that day, would anyone have found this display? What was the purpose of this brazen act? Hyunsu was not the only person who found the body. There was also two others, a father and a son, who were beekeepers from out of town who stumbled upon the scene after Hansu had called the police. The two men were walking the mountain trying to find somewhere pretty to set up their beekeeping, which this area is famous for, when they stumbled upon the quarry and the deceased. The area is incredibly popular for beekeeping. If you get into that area that Hansu has his bees, there are dozens of other people who have hives in this small clearing area. The quarry was in the side of a rocky hill, with large stones jutting out of the ground. In the mining area was a small flat area. The yellow wood of the cross was just barely visible against the stone background from the path Hansu took. A single occupant tent was set up a little bit further away, with various tools strewn outside on the ground. As Hansu approached the cross, he hoped that it was just a statue for the campers to pray at. But some sparse trees concealed the cross, and that is why Hansu needed to get closer and get a better look at the display. When he did approach from a few meters away, it was clear that this was a real person, hanging by the arms on the cross, with white rope holding up the torso and nails sticking out of the hands. The man was naked except for a cloth diaper kind of underwear that was tied around him. The man's head was secured to the cross with more white rope to hold up his head, and on his head was a crown made of branches with thick thorns cutting into the skin. The blood was dry on the man's head and hands, as well as puncture wound to his ribs under his right breast. The cross itself wasn't tall enough for his feet to be off of the ground, so his knees bent at a 45 degree angle as the body sunk. The wooden cross was a little over 185 centimeters or 6 feet tall at its top, with two thin smaller crosses set up to the left and right of the man's body. 
On his right side, a circular vanity mirror was hanging away from the cross with wire, facing the man. It was positioned just so he could see himself. It appeared that the mirror was placed so that the man could watch himself dying. At the man's feet were two items, a small clock that still ticked, facing the man, and a long whip made from woven plastic packing string, the flat plastic polyester string that secures boxes and warehouses. There is also a small hand drill and a hammer. We will go through the layout of his body and how the police believe the death to have occurred a little bit later in this episode. Chu hyun Su was asked to stay with the police to return to the station after they secured the crime scene. While the police officers walked around the area and conducted an on-site investigation, hyun Su walked around with them. The police officers asked him not to take any photos after he tried taking some more on his cell phone, which he decided to do when they weren't looking. He'd already taken multiple photos on his cell phone prior to their arrival, but as it got dark, he took a few more. Hyunsu did not post the photos from the crime scene until after the conclusion of the investigation, although I still find it a bit disrespectful to the deceased to post pictures online. While he waited, the officers asked him about himself, which he revealed he was a former pastor. He told the police that the scene appeared to be a near-perfect recreation of the death of the Christian deity Jesus. The officers agreed to ask Hyunsu to consult them on the initial investigation for input about the religious significance of everything that was done to the man. The officer led Hyunsu to the man's tent, and the investigators began to take the items out of the tent and label them in bags. The items inside the tent would be crucial to understanding what happened to this man. Among the items was a small pocket Bible. Hyunsu wore gloves and searched the Bible for information that would help find the man's identity or what church he belonged to. There were no locations in the Bible nor writings on the front and the back. Inside the pages were pristine. It was as if the Bible was never touched by hands or was possibly brand new. The only thing in the Bible was a slip of paper with a passage from the religious text copied down. It was the passage... Luke 4, 18 to 19. This part of the book read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. With this quote was a depiction of Jesus printed out on a large piece of paper folded around a piece of cardboard. The cardboard inside had Hebrew and Greek written on it. Hyunsu initially believed that this was just another part of the Bible written in another language, but then he saw the symbol for king at the bottom of the page, which made him realize that this was a reference to the sign that was affixed to Jesus's crucifixion cross that read King of the Jews. Hyunsu told the police to look for another piece of paper cardboard or wood, something that may have fallen off of the man's cross that had the same symbol because it was missing from the crucifixion display. With the level of details that this crucifixion had and the presence of the note that detailed the sign, it was unlikely that any of this was unrelated to the death. As they went through more of the papers that were in the tent and car, everything was detailed about the death. The biggest mystery surrounding this death was whether or not it was a suicide, which the public didn't have access to this information through large news sources who played off of fears of the public. The idea of a man being crucified as a form of murder was inflammatory and just offensive enough of an idea to go viral in the media. But as was the idea that a man had somehow crucified himself, the logistics of it just didn't make sense. But the question wasn't whether or not it was a suicide or murder now, because it was clear that this man had partaken in the planning of his own crucifixion regardless. The question was, did he have help? Because assisted suicide, even by medical professionals in dire situations, is illegal in South Korea. Assisted crucifixion, although difficult for me to find a finite answer on this, I'm guessing is illegal almost everywhere in the world. Hyunsu found papers detailing the construction of the cross that had the address of the mountain's location. He actually found two documents that would lend insight into the mind of the man hung up on that cross. 
The first document detailed the meticulous blueprint for the construction of the cross and how he designed a sturdy base to support his own weight and secure it into the ground. This paper looked like an architect or an engineer had made it. The document had the exact measurements that he would need to cut out of the wood. It didn't have any words on it, but was only the numbers and equations he needed to calculate what he needed to construct the cross. The second document was the complete opposite of the first paper. It was dirty, and the handwriting was messy. It was written on a ripped car dealership's envelope. While the first document had straight lines drawn by a ruler, the second document was as if it was done by a completely different person. This note detailed what the deceased man would do on the day that he died. The first thing written said, Turn on the tent lights at 4 a.m. Then it had a list from numbers 1 to 5. First on the list was just the word feet. The police concluded that this referred to the fact that he had nailed his feet onto the footrest that forced him to half squat from the cross when hanging from it. Second, it said 39 times with a pepper whip. The word pepper here is misleading because he used the word gochu, like gochujang, which is like a red pepper sauce. Gochu means pepper, but it is also used to refer to a penis. That means that the whip that was found was used specifically to whip himself 39 times in the genitals, which imitated the number of times that it was said Jesus was whipped by those who crucified him. The story specifically states that Jesus was whipped 40 times minus one. Although Jesus was not whipped in the genitals, he was whipped on his back. So they believed that this meant the man had some guilt tied to his own sins, particularly They believed either he was punishing himself for lust or adultery. A conclusive answer wasn't found through his personal effects or from those who knew him. Either way, he decided to punish himself prior to his crucifixion. Third on the list, it said, tie your waist and tie your chest. A rope was tied around his waist and around the top of the cross so that when he lifted himself up inside, it would hold him up by the head and neck. Step four was one word, trembling with another word crossed out. However, when they were able to reconstruct the hidden word, it was revealed that it really said to nail one's own hands. Fifth on the list said to put your elbows in the ties and place hands. We'll go through the police's and private investigators' recreations of the events a little bit later. Don't worry, there will be more explanation. There were some notes at the bottom reminding him to secure the mirror, get a knife, and hang the sign. The mirror was there and secured so he could see his own face. The knife referred to the wound he gave himself on the rib cage, mimicking the wound Jesus received on his ribs. And then finally, the sign. But the sign was found in the tent. So possibly there was another sign, but the police never found one near the crime scene outside. But if it was made with the same materials as the cardboard one in the tent, it may have fallen off and blown away in the wind or been taken away by an animal. Within the car, there was also evidence that the man had purchased his car in Changwon. He wasn't from the area, but had connections to Changwon. Within the car, there was also evidence that the man had purchased his car recently in Changwon. He wasn't from this area, but instead seemed to be from Changwon. He had a ballpoint pen with the name Changwon Sangyang Motors printed on it, and a tissue packet with the address and name of a gas station in Changwon. Changwon is a coastal city just west of Busan, whereas this mountain in Mungyang is in the very middle of the country, about two and a half hours north. With Korea being such a small country, it isn't often that someone would travel that far to go to a secluded mountain. Within the tent, they also discovered several compression bandages and medical kits. However, there were not any painkillers, antibiotics, or anything that someone would take to actually survive an injury without pain. However, they did find a small vial of tranquilizers that when taken in large doses can cause heart attacks or hallucinations. They thought maybe this man was a drug addict who had been taking these tranquilizers and that's what led to this. A piece of identification was found in his car's center console, a driver's license, and the insurance for his car that revealed his name was Gim. His legal name was not released to the public, so we can call him Gim Jaebong. He was 58 years old and was a taxi driver according to the documents in his car. 
The police would try to find his next of kin when they returned to the station, but for now they continued to collect and preserve evidence at the scene. The tent, which seemed to be used as a makeshift workshop, contained woodworking tools. There was a hand drill, large nails, a ruler, chisel, and a hammer. Discarded used wood scraps were around the tent as well. There were about 20 blankets stacked inside of the tent and a lot of bread and water. But there was no evidence of any food being consumed in the time he was there. The chief of police arrived at the scene a few hours later after the other police arrived and told Hyunsu that he would be returning to the station with an officer to make his statement. Hyunsu wrote on his blog later that he wondered what would have happened if his dogs hadn't have been barking that day and made him want to leave the house for some quiet. He wondered if he hadn't had bees near the quarry if anyone would have found the deceased. The police took his statement about what he saw and that he hadn't heard anything strange from the mountain in the previous days. While Kim Jae-bung's body was found on May 1st, the police believed that he had died three days prior, which would have landed his death a few days prior to Easter during Holy Week. Holy Week, sometimes called Passion Week, begins on Palm Sunday in the Christian faith, signifying the day Jesus entered Jerusalem. The week goes through the Last Supper, the crucifixion on Good Friday, and ends on Easter Sunday, which is when Jesus was said to have resurrected. With the body's autopsy, it was likely that he had tried to time his death with the day of the crucifixion of Jesus. However, with the heavy rains and the time since his death, the exact estimated time of his death was impossible to determine. The heavy rains washed away most of the evidence, including fingerprints and skin cells that would have been on any of the tools. But with his attention to details about the story of the death of Jesus, it was most likely that the day he died was Friday, April 29th, which was Good Friday. As Ju Hyun Su spoke to the police, he kept thinking about the deceased man's identity. He felt like somehow he knew this man. It was bothering him the entire interview. Then suddenly he remembered that he had offered religious counseling to a man who had joined his neighbor cafe forum. Hyunsu, even after retiring as a pastor due to his church's rocky past, still offered religious counseling and advice through his online blog, where he would eventually post about this case. In his past, Hyunsu was a pastor at Monmin Central Church when evangelist Lee jae Dok led the church in the 90s and into the early 2000s. This church leader claimed to be personally connected to God and that he himself would sit on the left side of the throne of the Christian God. While he lost support of many of the church orders and associations, the leader continued to gain support from his devout followers who believed that he was the chosen one. Issues started to arise about their leader, Jerok, stating that he often called women from his following to come to his home and participate in group sex. He also used church funds to travel to Las Vegas, USA, and gamble. Coming into the 2000s, the church received a lot of backlash, labeling them a cult and saying that they went against the church's beliefs. So they started to try to move away from deifying their leader, at least when advertising to new members. It was around this time that Hyunsu left the church. Although unrelated to the case, I think it's interesting to note that Hyunsu left the church at the right time. Although we don't know his involvement in the church's activities, but the leader Lee Jae-dok would go on into the 2010s to increase the importance of donation and monetary gifts to the church, as well as announce that the Christian God had granted him the ability to forgive sins through confessions. He told his followers that he suffered nonstop by absolving his followers of sin. He said he took on their pains and their sin, which caused him stomach and skin diseases. He often experienced nosebleeds and migraines as well, which to anyone familiar with other cult leaders, this could have just been a drug problem he was hiding. However, in 2018, much after today's case, Lee jae Rok was arrested after multiple women came forward about his years of being a serial rapist. The trial has ended and he was sentenced to 16 years in prison. The church has continued under his third daughter alongside two twins who told the church's followers that the police and law cannot touch you. Since then, they've erected a large statue of Lee jae Rok for people to worship at. I don't mention this because this small church has such an interesting descent into what would be considered a cult by the Korean government, 
but that this is actually a mega church with a huge following. They have churches in Japan, Mongolia, Taiwan, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, London, France, Moldova, Kenya, Congo, America, Canada, Colombia, and Honduras. These churches exist to this day, although Hyunsu left the church in 1999 due to his disagreements with the deification of the leader. Well, back to early 2008, Ju Hyun Soo continued to offer advice and counseling to anyone who wanted it. Generally, he made posts relating to his beliefs in Taoism, not necessarily his past in Christianity. Hyun Soo had talked online with a man who asked for spiritual guidance named Kim Jaebong. Hyun Soo gave the police access to this blog and showed them the member that he thought might be the deceased man. When going through the messages, the man's profile picture matched that of the deceased man. The case became increasingly complicated. Had Jaebong planned his own suicide for months or years? Did he plan on killing himself near Hyun Soo so that Hyun Soo would find him? The police also wondered if Hyun Soo had encouraged Jaebong's thoughts about suicide or if Hyun Soo himself had participated in the crucifixion. Kim jae Bung signed up for the Naver Cafe Forum on April 18, 2008, and logged in for the last time on January 31, 2011. He remained a silent member from April 2008 until late fall that year. Then, Hyun Soo was messaged by jae Bung asking if he could call him for advice. Hyun Soo typically was free to talking to anyone who asked him for help, so he gave jae Bung his phone number and waited for his call. When he got the call, Jaebong asked if the two of them could meet and have lunch together to talk about what troubled him instead of doing it over the phone. Hyun Soo, being a kind host, offered to let the man stay at his house and have a home-cooked meal with him. He asked Jaebong for how long he would like to stay so he could make the preparations for him. It wasn't a burden on him. He was willing to let Hyun Soo stay at his home for any amount of time. But Jaebong declined and said that he would visit just for a few hours so it wasn't necessary. Hyun Soo often had visitors who were strangers to him who wanted to talk about religion or life's troubles, so he couldn't remember this specific visit very well. It was a long time ago and Hyun Soo was getting older. He recalled the conversation was a bit unusual and that Jaebong had some intense ideas relating to the Christian faith. He remembered how dangerous these ideas can be from his own past with the Monmin Church, so he changed the subject to avoid encouraging these kinds of belief. He asked Jaebong about his family and he talked about his divorce. Kim Jaebong was married but got divorced in 1994. His wife left him, stating that she didn't like who Jaebong became when he was too invested in his religion. She specifically said that it was as if he was addicted to religion and his entire life was consumed by the thought of it, and there wasn't any room in the relationship for her any longer. After his divorce, Jaebong lived alone and worked for a private taxi business in Changwon. The two sat and talked about life, living in the mountain, and Hyun Soo's beekeeping. Jaebong was very interested in the beekeeping, and together they walked up the mountain to the peak to see all of the hives. He showed Jaebong how to take care of the bees, and then the two of them returned to his home, where Jaebong drove himself home. Hyun Soo remembered it was strange to see Jaebong drive himself home in his work taxi. It was possibly the only car that he had. After that day together, Hyun Soo never heard from him again, and he never interacted on the blog. The police concluded that Hyun Soo didn't likely have any involvement in the death of Kim Daebong. They believed that Hyun Soo was telling them the truth. He hadn't convinced Daebong to kill himself or had participated in helping crucify him. This was concluded because there were no other sets of fingerprints at the crime scene, although there were torrential rains in the days following his death, prior to the discovery of his body, so they didn't disprove it, they just couldn't prove that Hyun Soo had any involvement. The police reached out to Kim jae Bong's family about his actions prior to his death. There was something missing from the puzzle. In the weeks prior, he had canceled his phone plan for the next month. He had also closed his bank account. He talked to his family occasionally and was close enough to his sister to contact her to hang out sometimes, but he didn't often talk to his family about his religious beliefs. However, his family did also attend church and belonged to the same religion as him. But when he began to clear out his apartment in mid-April, his family didn't notice. Nobody had been to his apartment in a really long while. Typically, he visited others or met outside of the home. Jaebong's little brother told the police that Jaebong didn't go to church anymore, but was insistent that the rest of the family went because he wanted them to go to heaven. 
Daebang had talked to his younger brother in the month prior to tell him that he would be moving to Myeongyang for his job. Taxi drivers don't often need a commute, especially to a rural location, but his family didn't question it. His cell phone was found in his car, and the last call he had made was to a lumber yard on April 13th to visit to purchase lumber for making the cross. The final purchases on his card were to purchase the tools and wood he needed to construct the cross, but he had asked his daughter to accompany him to purchase these items. His daughter didn't comment on what she thought these would be used for at the time. He often called his daughter and son to check on them, asking if they were going to church. Although he didn't reveal to anyone his plans and he didn't talk to anyone about his extreme religious ideas. We can't speak to his feelings about anyone, but in the years prior, Jaebong had fallen ill and his liver began to fail in 2000. He had a youngest son who offered to undergo a liver transplant for him. However, shortly after giving the life-saving liver transplant, his youngest son passed away. Following the death of his youngest son, Daebang became detached from the family and everyone said he was never the same again. He began to distance himself and seclude away from others. He continued to work long hours as a taxi driver and called them to ask about church and religion, but nothing more than that. His grief seemed to lead him to become even deeper involved in his religious beliefs, although he did this in solitude. In early April, he'd visited a car dealership to purchase a new car. He went to the Changwang car dealership, and the car salesman told the police that Tebang was insistent that whatever car he purchased could never be owned by anyone before and never had anyone drive it before. He wanted the car to be quite literally brand new. And the car he bought was brand new. He told the car salesman that he would take his friends who he hiked with up to the mountain. He spun a story of hiking up the mountains and driving off road and needing a car that could go up the rocky roads and meet his friends. He talked about being a part of the mountaineering club, which was not a real thing. He continued to tell stories about his club and their activities, but the salesman didn't know Daebang. He had no reason to disbelieve or believe anything that was being told to him. So it was really odd that Daebang really went out of his way to prove that he was telling the truth. Perhaps Daebang was in a moment of paranoia regarding others discovering his plans, and that caused him to feel that others around him were suspicious. But since he wanted a brand new car that was never once used, the dealership told him he would need to go all the way to Pyeongtaek to pick up the car from the manufacturing factory. Just getting the car onto a transportation truck would require a person to get into the car and drive it up on the ramp. It's likely that they believed Daebang was a germaphobe or struggled with obsessive compulsive behaviors because they allowed him to. They allowed him to go all the way to Pyeongtaek, which was hours away, and pick up the car. When he purchased the brand new 2011 Corando, he later invited his brother to go out with him and immediately started acting weird. Before his brother could even get into the car, he grabbed some brand new towels and placed them on the seat and then started saying prayers over them. Perhaps he really wanted his car to remain well taken care of, but having already started his plans to kill himself, it was an interesting choice to care so greatly about his new car's interior detailing. But it makes a lot of sense with relation to the Christian Bible story in the book of Luke. The passage says that Jesus rode a donkey on his way to Jerusalem and that Jesus asked for the donkey to have never been ridden by anyone before him, so his disciples placed their cloaks on the donkey's back. Kim Daebang was involving his unknowing family into his recreation of the time leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. That car was his donkey. When investigators reached out to Kim's family while the case was all over the news, his family had no idea that he had even died. His sister said that she lost contact with him a little while ago. He had stopped contacting her. The loneliness in his life that his obsession with the crucifixion of Jesus created could be a contributing factor into his suicide. Although it seems that there were many factors in his life that affected his happiness and his will to live. The grief of the passing of his son, his divorce, the estrangement from his community to his fanatical religious beliefs, were all compounding in his life. So after getting his car, Kim Jae-bong immediately visited the mountain. He would visit the mountain twice prior to his death, on April 2nd and April 4th, to check out the quarry and manifest his plans. As with most criminal cases in South Korea, the television series Gugoshi Algo Shepta, or Unanswered Questions, has made a few videos regarding the case. They originally aired in June of 2011. 
just a month after the discovery of the body. The investigative team wanted to recreate the crime scene to understand if a person could have done this to themselves alone. Could someone physically secure the ties, place their hands in the cords, and crucify themselves? Pain aside, it looked almost impossible of a position for a man to even put himself in. With the assistance of the police and forensic scientists from the National Institute of Science and Technology, the recreation of the crime scene began. They had the evidence from the crime scene, such as the tools, the crown of thorny sticks, and the ropes that he used. While in their recreation, they did not use the original items to not contaminate them, they did use replicas to an almost identical quality. This could reveal the truth about the man's death and how it occurred. Korea and the religious world were morbidly curious about the answer. In the lab, they took the original cross that the man created and secured the new compression bandages, cords, and strings at the exact places that Kim Jae-bong had secured them. On the cross, they discovered small notes written in black marker. They said the words head, waist, wrist, and arm. He had marked the exact locations that his body would be from a hanging position. He had calculated everything that would happen perfectly to not make any mistakes when the day came. The ritual began early that morning at 4.50 a.m. The sun hadn't risen yet. It was pitch black outside. Because Jesus was sentenced to death at dawn, which was 5 a.m., Kim Jae-bong also needed to start at 5 a.m. But Jesus wasn't placed on the cross until closer to 9 a.m which historians and theologists have estimated based off the wording of the stories. Tebang didn't merely study the story. He knew every last detail of the crucifixion of Jesus. He even picked the quarry for a very, very specific reason. Jesus was said to have been crucified in a rocky hillscape called Golgotha, meaning skull or bald head. To recreate his landscape, he needed a tall rocky mountain, which Mungyang was the perfect location. Kim Jae-bang had built the large and two small crosses in the days prior. He dug a small hole in the ground and placed the cross into the rocky, solid dirt and anchored it in the ground, with the cross's footrest touching the ground. He ripped long strips of compression bandages and tied them with the right circumference on both sides of the cross so that his arms would be supported against the wood. The mirror was secured and checked, making sure he would be able to see himself and what he was doing once he was secured to the cross. Once there was no going back, he needed to be able to see what he was doing. At this point, Jaebong had the option to take the tranquilizers, perhaps in case that he would lose motivation to continue. But since his autopsy shows no signs of drugs or alcohol, he continued on sober. His stomach was empty at the time of his death, quite similarly to the fasting Jesus was said to have done. Although his body was not gaunt, his brother noted a month prior he was looking more stressed than normal. Tevang gathered his tools, the nails, drill, hammer, and a small knife. He secured the crown of thorns on his head. The branches were made from a tangerine tree, which had large, sharp thorns in all of its branches. He secured the crown tightly enough to ensure that it broke the skin on his head. He began the ritual. He was entirely nude except for the plain cloth underwear. Kim Jae-bang placed his right foot on the footrest and squatted down, holding the nail and the hammer on his foot. He'd studied the anatomy of the foot to learn that if you drive the nail between the big toe and the second toe, you can still hold your weight on that foot without extreme pain, which would make his body work against him. The pain itself would stop you from continuing. However, placing the nail here would not damage the ligament. The nail he used was bent at a right angle, so he could reach around his knees as he squatted and strike the nail. He lifted the hammer and brought it down with full force to secure the nail in place. The forensic scientist suggests that securing the nail deeply would require more than one blow of the hammer. So he continued to hammer into his foot until his foot was completely secured to the footrest. The nail was a few centimeters into the wood. He lifted his left foot onto the footrest and balanced himself from falling forward. He took the second nail and hammered it into his foot with a greater force, striking it into the wood even further below. Although the second nail was not placed as carefully, he wouldn't have been able to see his foot easily, so it was more likely that he placed this nail where he could reach, at the top of the middle of his foot, and drove the nail through as quickly as he could. After experiencing the pain of the first nail, one might think he would hesitate, but he was already in the frenzy of emotions and adrenaline, so he continued. 
Both of his feet were nailed through side by side, and now he needed to stand up from a squatting position. It's worth noting that many people in Asia can comfortably perform a flat-footed squat, commonly referred to as the Asian squat. So when he was nailing his feet down while squatting, his feet were flat to the footrest. The footrest wasn't angled like some depictions of crucifixions. Since it was keeping the cross secured in place, he stood up and tossed the hammer aside. He tied the rope around his waist and his head and neck, so when he started to hang, the rope would prevent his body from falling forward off of the cross. To perfectly recreate the crucifixion, he needed to stab himself in the ribs. As the story of Jesus' crucifixion states that a soldier had stabbed him there with a spear. Using a small blade, he used the mirror to place the blade and insert it. This is the one detail that forensic scientists had a lot of difficulty believing that he didn't have an accomplice for. The angle at which the blade went in appeared to have been from someone else stabbing the blade upward into his ribs. The close-range stabbing would be incredibly difficult to angle and insert by your own hand, but not impossible. Most of the recreation scenes do not discuss his act of whipping himself, perhaps because talking about a man whipping his own genitals 39 times with polyester cord is a little bit disturbing, but it was a part of his process. He'd even made sure to include it on his list. He didn't just need to die in the same manner as Jesus, he needed to suffer greatly. At this point, his body was secured to the cross except for his hands which he now needed to nail to the cross. How can a person drive nails through their hands? Even if you get the first nail through, you can't nail your second hand. And he'd planned this through. He had hammered the nails onto the cross. These long nails were sticking out in the front and back of the wood a few inches. And in the back, they were secured again. While secured to the cross by the nails in his feet and the ropes, he got a manual drill from his waistband. The drill was something I'd never seen before, although perhaps someone who does construction or carpentry may recognize a drill like this. The drill itself had a handle with a hand-molded grip and a short drill coming out of it. It looked like a gimlet drill mixed with a push dagger. A gimlet is like a hand tool used for making cylindrical holes in wood. It typically is used one-handed and is quite small. A push knife is a small dagger that has a T-shaped handle with the blade coming out in the middle of your fingers. This drill was gripped between the middle and pointer finger and twisted back and forth as he drilled the hole into his hands. In the hand, there is a space between the pointer finger and the middle finger, just below the joint, right between the metacarpus bone, right between the metacarpus bones. There are many blood vessels there and thick muscles, but for the hand drill to work, he needed to avoid hitting the bones. He continued to drill the hole in his hand and then, with the hand finished, gripped the drill and continued with his second hand. He couldn't hesitate at this point because the blood loss could lead to weakness, difficulty focusing, and losing consciousness and dying. From his autopsy pictures, we can see that he had drilled into his hands starting from the palm side. This detail is different from the story of Jesus' crucifixion. The nail location in Jesus' hands were very clearly in the center, which would have gone through the bone. When he was done, he tossed the drill away onto the ground, and now it was time to finish his ritual. He slipped his arms through the hanging pre-tied compression bandages that were fashioned into loops to hang his arms from, and slowly, with his palms facing outward, pushed the back of his right hand onto the nail head. There was no tearing in the hand wound, which said that he did this on his first try. There was no struggle. The hanging mirror may have come in handy for seeing the position of the nail. He then repeated the process with his left hand, and then the ritual was complete. We don't know how long he stayed alive after completing the crucifixion, or what his thought process was once he finished. There were no signs of a struggle after he got himself onto the cross, so it's likely he died quickly without his body trying to resist the pain. His blood loss was pretty severe, which led the investigators and scientists to believe that he began to lose consciousness due to blood loss. When the consciousness faded, his body weakened causing him to slump and lose stiffness in his limbs. As his legs bent into a crouch, his weight was not supported by his hands, but instead the bandages supporting his arms. His head was also supported by the rope, one of which was loosely tied around his neck. But as he slumped down the cross, it took the blunt of his weight, which compressed his neck. A person being supported by their arms above their head, slightly behind them, is going to pull on the muscles in the chest and ribcage 
This position limits the expansion of the chest and lungs, which then led to asphyxiation. The forensic scientist agreed that he died from blood loss and suffocation. I can only wonder what his last thoughts were. Kim Jae-bong needed help in his life. If your experience with religion is positive, it may be confusing to see how a person's own journey with religion can really hurt them like this. Daebong wasn't interested in his religion in a philosophical manner or for the community connection. To understand his addiction to religion, it's important to understand that just as other addictions affect our ability to feel happy, a person's obsession can as well. According to the National Association for Christian Recovery, a Christian faith nonprofit, Mood alteration caused by various substances like alcohol and drugs causes the body to produce its own addictive chemicals, which forces a person to crave and seek out more of the substance. This occurs in a cyclical way that can be observed in many cases. The addicted person first becomes preoccupied with their substance of choice. In this case, Tebang chose his obsession with the crucifixion of Jesus. This preoccupation can look like daydreaming, thinking about it often, and surrounding yourself with it. Tebang secluded himself away from his family and left his church. He buried his nose in his Bible and became obsessed with his own religious beliefs. Preoccupations can happen to anyone, not just addicts, so this is a crucial stage to prevent an unhealthy pattern from being created. Maybe you daydream about your hobbies at work, but you're still able to perform your job and are able to resist your desires in the moment. That would be a normal preoccupation. But then, your preoccupation becomes a ritual. Ritualization of your preoccupation means that you now like to engage in your obsession in the same way each time, such as praying each night before bed in the same manner in the same position, a normal behavior to many people. This can also look like getting home and having a drink on your couch. Your mood changes because of this ritual. You feel safe in this action because you're doing it the same way every time, and it makes you happy. If you don't engage in this act the same way every time, it may make your mood sour. This is still a safe zone for many people. You aren't quite into an addiction, but then you begin to engage in addictive behavior because you need a bigger emotional reaction. You binge on your favorite food. You start to drink more, or you start to seclude yourself from your church so they don't judge your more extreme opinions. You may do whatever you want to chase that feeling to get your substance. Then finally, you may do whatever you want to do to chase that feeling that you get from your substance. Then finally, you find yourself in active addiction. You begin acting in ways you wouldn't normally, you begin to obsess about it, and you may hurt people you care about. When you don't have your substance, your mood crashes and you feel worse than you ever have which causes you to return to your substance to feel the higher mood once again. Then the mood-altering cycle continues. Typical examples of religious addiction are cults that encourage self-harm in any form, whether that be deprivation or injury. But it isn't always this extreme. Anything in your life can become addictive and bring pain and suffering into your life. Sex, food, medicine, anything can be taken to an extreme. Religious addiction involves a distinct scenario where the practice often involves rituals. It's common to repetitively recite prayers or memorize biblical passages in a church setting, as well as experience emotional highs from evangelizing to strangers publicly. All individuals struggling with addiction will eventually face the void created by its absence, potentially resulting in a crash or negative emotions. People in any religion may face the guilt of feeling like they haven't done enough. They may ask themselves, what can you do to do more for your God? Compared to a person who suffers from alcohol addiction, whose mood is altered by drinking or not, a religious addict may feel negatively when they can't attend church or feel like they haven't done enough to prove their worth to their faith. An alcoholic may choose to only surround themselves with others who also heavily drink or put themselves in situations in which people are drinking as well. A religious person may seclude themselves from anyone who doesn't share their religious belief. In Daebong's situation, no one around him felt as severely or intensely as he did about his religion. Therefore, he distanced himself from everyone. With Hyunsoo being a former Christian pastor and Daebong having a religious addiction that he lost his battle with, what makes Christianity so popular in South Korea? The introduction of Christianity to Korea goes back just a little over 100 years ago. Catholicism, though, was introduced to Korea during the 1700s by Catholic missionaries whose real mission was to go to China and introduce religion and Western learning. But when some missionaries traveled to Korea, they found that the Korean people could also easily read the Chinese books 
and were interested. However, many of these books that focus on subjects like math, science, and technology were accepted by the people, but largely the religious texts were rejected. Korea has always had their own traditional religions, shamanism, and animism, so they weren't open to accepting a new religion. Going into the 1800s, Korean Catholics were living on the fringe of society and were considered outcasts by the most of Korea. Catholic missionaries continued to come to South Korea to offer medical teaching and a assist the American government. This attitude towards Catholicism continued into the Japanese occupation in 1910. Korea was annexed by Japan and was in extremely depressing times. During times where people begin to lose hope, they want help and they want to feel that happiness again because Japan forced Korea to submit to their religions, which was mostly Shintoism. No religion is better than another. I'm not judging them. But the Korean people didn't want a religion that was being forced upon them by a military. So when Protestant missionaries came to Korea, they offered solutions to many of Korean people's problems. They offered free education and Western medicine and also started building schools and hospitals. A lot of Koreans remember this as a true act of altruism by the missionaries. Not all Korean people welcomed missionaries. Both historically and in modern times, Some Koreans have harbored resentment towards the impact of Western medicine, education, and religion in Korea. As Japan sought to eliminate Korean culture forcibly, the presence of Western missionaries, especially those from America, seemed to mirror this approach but with a smile and food rations. For some individuals, whether the intentions behind the influence were positive or negative didn't matter. They simply desired to preserve their culture as it was, or to see it evolve under the guidance of their own people. During this time, Japan had banned the Korean language in Korea, compelling Koreans to adopt Japanese and change their names. This oppression by the Japanese military fueled the desire among the Korean people to resist. Though their options were limited, they found solace in reclaiming their happiness. Churches acted as safe havens for Koreans to openly complain about the occupation and oppression they were under, which was supported by the American Protestant missionaries who aided in organizing peaceful demonstrations, despite some of these turning violent due to Japanese military intervention. Just having a space to air out their grievances was incredibly helpful for them to start the healing process. Christianity endured in South Korea thanks to the missionary methods that empowered Koreans not only as recipients of the faith, but also as their own preachers, which led to the ordination of the first Korean priest. They didn't just want people to be listening and following them, they wanted them to go out and spread Protestantism themselves. Christianity seamlessly integrated into Korean culture and remained popular. However, as more Koreans assumed roles as priests, Many Korean churches began to have distinct interpretations of the Bible, which has ultimately led to the increase of fringe sects of Christianity in South Korea. The hierarchical aspect of Korean culture, rooted in filial piety, seamlessly connected with the inherently patriarchal nature of Christianity. The unique blend of Korean hierarchical structure and Christian patriarchal structure provided a very strong foundation for Christianity to flourish in Korea during times of trouble. It doubled down on their own way of treating elders and the culture of listening to your elders. I'm not implying that Korea is a nation that blindly follows the elderly, but there is a strong mentality of listening and trusting those who are older and wiser than you. This unique blend of traditional Korean values and Christian beliefs gave rise to a fascinating tapestry of religious practices in South Korea. The influence of filial piety and hierarchical structure in Korea provided a strong foundation for the patriarchal structure within Christianity. As a result, the proliferation of various interpretations of the Bible within Korean churches added layers of complexity to the religious diversity of the country. Following Korea's divide after World War II, Protestantism almost disappeared from South Korea because largely most of the Protestant believers lived in what was now North Korea, which is incredibly religiously intolerant. Many Protestant believers fled to South Korea under President Lee sung man who converted to Protestantism while imprisoned by the Japanese. He decided that Christianity would become the one religion that would liberate them against communism, and under his rule, Christianity was the unofficial religion, although it was never official. 
After the Korean War, the nation wanted to make a very large push to modernize the entire nation and bring the country back to glory. The start of this was ensuring that the nation was very well educated. Of course, at this time, it was mainly men going to school, while women were expected to raise the families. Men who applied and failed to get into universities would then go on to theology schools. Unfortunately, With so many religious leaders in South Korea lacking any higher formal education and merely theological training from short programs offered by churches, this led to a lot of uneducated leaders who led people in a culture that was taught to listen to those above them, like their parents, bosses, or pastors. This would be where many people saw the unique interpretations of Protestantism bloom from taking advantage of the fact that many Koreans are dutiful to their elders and people with more power than them, these pastors require attendance and tithing. When you tithe, you don't discreetly pass along a collection basket. You have to line up in the church, which makes it very obvious who is donating and for how much. It becomes extremely performative. Merely being profit-driven or having a leader who interprets religious texts liberally doesn't automatically classify a church as a cult. There is a common misconception that Korea is home to a disproportionate amount of cults. While we will delve into a few Korean cults in the future, it's important to note that cults tend to be a lot more secretive and exclusive in their practices compared to these large followings. This doesn't mean that they don't start as cults, but over time they evolve into megachurches. Some sociologists suggest that a religion is just a cult that has transitioned successfully and become mainstream. Christianity remains popular in South Korea, despite the country's increasing atheism. The Korean Protestant worship scene now leans towards traditional and conservative practices. These churches are renowned for their large congregations and expansive buildings akin to the mega churches in America. For instance, Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul has half a million parishioners with 21,000 people attending each Sunday. When in South Korea, you'll notice giant red crosses illuminating the night sky everywhere. The widespread popularity of Christianity in South Korea can be attributed to the country's willingness to adopt Western influence, setting it apart from many other Asian countries. While not all Koreans may favor America, they have embraced the cultural shift. Kim Dae-bong's descent into religious addiction drove him to crucify himself. His unfortunate suicide will be remembered around the world. While there was a lot of discourse surrounding this case about whether or not Kim Dae-bong had an accomplice helping him or had someone encouraging him to crucify himself, The ultimate agreement amongst the police, investigators, and those in his life is that he did this alone. Reenactments of his actions suggest that it is possible to do this alone, but what do you think? As always, thank you for listening to Korean True Crime. I hope you enjoyed today's episode topic. If you'd like to vote on future episode topics, join Korean True Crime on Patreon today. If you'd like to hear more, follow the show wherever you listen and be sure to leave me a review. Show sources are available for free on Patreon. 다음에 또 봐요. See you next time.